Hey everyone, Brian Zane here with my review of WWE's United Kingdom Championship Tournament Part 2, Royal Albert Boogaloo. This show, this two-day event, which took place at the Royal Albert Hall in England several weeks ago, uh, helped usher in officially the new UK brand that had been uh, theorized and talked about and speculated on ever since last year's UK tournament, but never fully realized and actualized until uh, this show was recorded. Of course, a lot of spoilers came out about this show uh, right after it took place. I try to keep myself as spoiler free as possible, but there's some things you just couldn't avoid. That being said, I did my best to try and remain kind of neutral and kind of wide eyed and just absorb everything here and just try and be, you know, and just try and enjoy it as a fan watching this kind of going in blind. Speaking of going in blind, that was to a fault for me because unlike last year, I didn't do a whole lot of research into the participants in this year's tournament. Last year, I really tried to educate myself on the bulk of the people involved. This year, I just had a lapse and I just didn't have time to research the people involved. So I, you know, I may sound a little ignorant in some of the things I will say about some of the people in this tournament and I apologize for that, but I'm just trying to watch it through new eyes as someone who is relatively unfamiliar with the Brit rest scene and I'm just trying to do my best to get ingratiated. I think uh, like myself, I think a lot of people will stand to learn a lot about UK wrestling through the NXT UK brand, which I'll get into a little bit more as this review goes on. Moro Ronaldo and Nigel McGuinness are on commentary for the event. The first tournament matchup here is Jack Gallagher versus Zach Gibson. Now, I have not been watching 205 Live lately, so I'm not sure how long Jack has had this new theme music, but I dig it. Of course, Gallagher was in the uh, first Cruiserweight Classic tournament. Now, this is his first uh, UK tournament here. Uh, Zach Gibson, boy. He is hated. He came out and right away got a standing boovation. Uh, the likes of which I had not heard from really anyone else in this tournament. So do I need to go back and do my research and find out like what this man has done to deserve such a negative, visceral reaction. Uh, I was definitely shocked when I saw that reaction there. A lot of chants throughout this whole weekend of shows I can't even begin to try and make out. Uh, submission and joint manipulation heavy in this matchup here, but it's very entertaining. Gibson's corner combo ending with the uh, the ticket to ride, I believe it's called. Wow, that was, I've never seen something like that before. An awesome submission that Jack Gallagher rolled into from the apron to the inside. I was mad that that wasn't the finish. That, to me, would have been a match ender right there. Gallagher's shoulder gets worked all match. Gibson blocks Gallagher's flying headbutt and puts him in the Shankly Gate. That is the, the submission to watch for this whole tournament. Jack uh, taps out. I'm going to give this one three stars. Hard to believe they opened with this match because they start off hot and heavy here with this tournament matchup. And it's right there. It's, it's an issue of try and top this. Up next, a couple of big boys in action here as Dave Mastiff takes on Joe Coffey. In the hype package for this matchup, Dave Mastiff closes out by saying, I'm going to show the world what I'm made of. My guess, Ham. He is a big boy. When I first saw this guy here in the tournament, I immediately went to my phone and looked up to see whether or not he's had a match with Jeff Cobb. I looked it up, found they have had a match, and now I have to watch that match because that is my kind of wrestling. Just two big hosses duking it out here. Just big dudes doing big dude things and somehow being able to fly around too, which is incredibly impressive. Coffee is able to suplex Mastiff a couple of times. They trade Germans back and forth. Ultimately, Coffee hits Mastiff with a discus lariat and wins, which of all the moves I saw in this match, that being the finisher surprised me. I'm going to give this match two and a half stars out of four. A hard-hitting, uh, big dude match. Very intense. I really enjoyed it. Up next, Jordan Devlin, who wrestled in last year's UK tournament, takes on Flash Morgan Webster, who actually made his WWE TV debut just a few weeks ago on 205 Live when the company toured in England. He looks really good here with his high-flying style, his quick moves. I have to say off the bat, I love this dude's gimmick. You know, someone who never really saw him before but only heard about him, seeing him here in action I think is great because I just love that throwback mod look he has. Really helps him stand out from just about everyone else in this tournament. Uh, Devlin at one point is a special Spanish fly off the top rope after they almost botch it. You can see them almost fall off and they collect themselves. They do the move and then right after that, Morrow and Ola just straight up loses his shit. Of all of the, the crazy things we'll see in this two night event, I feel like this spot has Morrow just screaming and the most apoplectic he is at the entire event. Spanish fly! Oh, Avalanche Spanish fly! By Jordan Devlin! Are you kidding me? Webster somehow survives, hits the Eaton Rifle to win and go on to the next round. I'm going to give this match two and a half stars. 
Our last quarterfinal match puts Travis Banks against Ashton Smith, or as I will call him here, English Ricochet. Uh, Morrow drops the tidbit that Smith once wrestled the Honky Tonk Man. My question was a two-part question. One, how long ago was this match? And two, how must that match have gone? Because anyone who's seen the Honky Tonk Man wrestle in the last mm, 10, 15 years knows it's like he's not the man he once was. So I would love to see that match. This match didn't quite grab my attention as much as the preceding matches. Part of it, I think, was just overall fatigue from the previous three and also because of these two I knew the least about. Uh, Banks does hit the slice of heaven, his big spin kick out of the corner uh, and then hits the Kiwi Crusher for the win. I'm going to give this one two stars out of four. We get a break from tournament action with a women's triple threat match. Tony Storm taking on Killer Kelly and Isla Dawn. Uh, the winner will face Shayna Baszler for the NXT Women's Championship the next night. Isla Dawn's intro choreography is pretty mellow. It's literally just there's a slight head tilt up. Oh, you're here. Like, I don't know if that was intentional, but the way she timed it with her music made me think that was an intentional move. Uh, Tony Storm does most of the selling in this matchup here. She's kind of like powdering out a lot here while Isla Dawn and Killer Kelly do the bulk of the work. And they're very good. I like their striking. I like the what these two are doing here. Storm hits Isla with the zero storm to win the match. I'm going to give it two stars out of four. Tony is the only one of these three who is treated like and presented like and acts like a star. It just looks like one. The other two don't to me have to me they don't have that star quality look compared to Tony Storm so to me it was no surprise she was going to go over in this one we will see more of Killer Kelly uh, in the next night up next Papa H comes out to the ring with a special announcement he brings out the general manager of the new UK brand British wrestling legend Johnny Saint they together introduce a new NXT UK brand and they say there's going to be you know a tag team division and a women's division oh golly gee you mean just like the one they have in America oh I can't wait so that was the big announcement and of course Johnny Saint being the the de facto or the on air general manager for that you know I think it's great news obviously for WWE it helps you know put their claws in different parts of of the world and another makes another pipeline essentially for creating new talent and new uh, television products. Some people are going to be mad that and they think that this is them WWE encroaching on the UK territory. But the way I look at it is this: when you consider how much NXT regular has helped expand people's knowledge and awareness of the independent scene in America and how much we know more about independent scene now than we did before. Thanks to NXT, it puts that spotlight on them. So too, I think NXT UK will help put that spotlight on the British wrestling scene more than without it. I think just in the last 18 months since the first tournament, I think it's done a great job in doing that. Obviously, the UK scene is doing great without WWE's influence, but I think that them putting the spotlight on them will just help them that much more. So I think it's going to do nothing but help the UK scene. I don't think they're going to hurt. I mean, time will tell. I could be dead wrong. But that's just my initial take when they announced this NXT UK brand. Another question I have that I thought of as I was watching this, how will call-ups work from here on out? Will NXT UK wrestlers then go to NXT America before possibly going to the main roster? Or will it be straight from UK to main roster? Or will the UK brand even have main roster call-ups? How will they work that? How will they find that balance in the raw after WrestleMania or whatever, when they bring up, you know, NXT talent, how much of that percentage will be American, how much will that be UK? I mean, obviously, time will tell. These are all strict speculative questions. Who really knows? But these are the things that are on my mind when they introduced the UK brand. In our first semifinal match, Zach Gibson takes on Flash Morgan Webster. Uh, Gibson works the arm. That is his MO the entirety of this tournament. Webster tries some flippy shit, but he gets intercepted at one point in the outside, hit with a helter-skelter on the ramp, which looks like a gnarly bump. Gibson, uh, I should say uh, Webster, barely avoids getting countered out, but as soon as he gets back in the ring, he's uh, locked in the Shankly gates, and Webster taps out. Gibson advances to the finals. I'm going to give this match two stars out of four. Obviously, I think this match had to be kind of toned down. They had to pace themselves a bit, especially Gibson, after the match he had in the previous round and the match he will have in the finals. So yeah, obviously this match is going to be at a different level. They got to slow things down a little bit after the excitement of the opening round. So yeah, two stars for me. We then get Joe Coffey versus Travis Banks in the other semifinal match. This one almost lost me because there was one point near the end where they just totally stopped what they were doing, this kind of awkward pause in the middle of a Coffey attack. But beyond that, it was a great match. And they came back from that kind of stumbling block 
in a major way. It's the strength of Joe Coffey versus the speed and the strikes of Travis Banks and the grunting of Travis Banks. Very grunty man here. Travis wins with an expertly timed roll-up, so he advances, and then after the match, I'm going to give this one three stars out of four, by the way. After the match, Coffey just beats down on Banks and throws his shoulder into the ring post. How convenient. It's, the, it's, 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 it's only the one part of the arm that Zach Gibson works in every matchup here. It feels a wee bit similar to the build that they had in last year's UK tournament when Tyler Bate was viciously assaulted before his match with Pete Dunne in the finals. I thought that was a little, that that to me, that was probably of all the things in this show, I think this to me is the biggest negative, is how similarly they booked the finals of the tournament as, compared to last year. That's just my, my my one problem with this show. Speaking of Bate and Dunn, the finalists from last year's tournament are partners on night one as uh, British Strong Style. It's Bate, Dunn, and Trent Seven take on the Undisputed Era, Adam Cole, Bebe, Kyle O'Reilly, and Roderick Strong in six-man action. This match, I'm not even going to try and break down, you know, spot for spot, because this thing is just, it's a tremendous match. If I recommend you guys check this one out, easily the best match of night one, in my opinion. Hard to follow this one. Uh, uh, my favorite spot is Tyler Bate doing the giant swing to Roderick Strong while Adam Cole is on his shoulders. That is some ungodly strength. How does he do that? I want to see Tyler Bate and Cesaro in a matchup yesterday. I want to see this match happening right away. The match ends when Bate takes out O'Reilly with the clothesline out of the rope rebound that he does so expertly. I'm going to give this match four stars. It was, like I said, best match of the night. Go check it out right now. Pause this video, open up the network, check the match out right now. You will not be disappointed. Before our main event, Shawn Michaels shows up and says some words of no consequence. Then we've got the tournament finals of Zach Gibson versus a very, very injured Travis Banks. The story here, Gibson working the shoulder, trying to get the Shankly Gates locked in. And of course, how on earth can Banks survive? Banks is able to do some crazy ass moves in spite of his injury. That is just the style of the time. Banks, who gets some blood around his eye at one point, gets caught in the gates, but is the first person in the tournament to grab a hold of the ropes and escape. Gibson kicks out of the slice of heaven and much more. Banks kicks out of Helter Skelter, and then he fights and fights and fights and tries to get out of the Shankly Gates, but ultimately he must succumb and tap out. So, in a refreshing change of pace, because I had complained earlier about how similarly they booked, they led up to the finals of last year's tournament and this year's uh, tournament. So, similar story, but a different finish, where this time the heel is the one who prevails, because last year is Tyler Bay who defied the odds and defied the injury and won the tournament. This year, lightning does not strike twice. The cruel Liverpool's number one, Zach Gibson goes on to win and will face Pete Dunne for the UK title match the following night. I'm going to give this one three and a half stars out of four. Beautiful match. Lots of drive and grit and emotion on display in this one. Between this match and the six man, what a hell of a way to wrap up night one. And after being congratulated by Triple H, Shawn Michaels, and Johnny Saint, Pete Dunne comes out. They have a good old stare down to close out the show. So who impressed me the most of night one? Like I said, I'm going into this pretty blind, not really familiar with a lot of the people involved. So of everyone in this tournament, I think Flash Morgan Webster, Joe Coffey, and Dave Mastiff stood the most out to me, just because, mostly because of their unique looks and their in-ring styles that differentiated from the norm. I think those are the ones that stood out to me. And if I had to pick some, would be my picks for future stars uh, in wrestling. In night two of the tournament, NXT UK as we know it officially begins here with the NXT themed intro for the show. It's uh, the yellow ropes again, the NXT turnbuckle pads and the apron. It is full on NXT at this point. It's no longer just some quaint side project of WWE. So this is the official beginning of the UK brand. First match of night two is for the NXT tag team titles as the Undisputed Era defend against Mustache Mountain of uh, Tyler Bate and Trent Seven who got a lot of momentum after the six man victory the previous night. Uh, dueling chance for Undisputed Era and Mustache Mountain. Lately, it seems uh, Undisputed Era, despite being heels, are super over and usually get cheered more than the supposed good guys they are facing. But, you know, this is kind of a deviation from the norm because now both guys, both teams, are getting tons of babyface love here, like the dueling chance show. Good heel work by Strong and O'Reilly in this matchup, cutting off the ring, keeping Seven from making the tag for a great while. More ridiculous strength shown here by Tyler Bate. He gives a German suplex to Strong while O'Reilly is 
on his back with a chin lock so that he gets flattened by uh, Bate as he goes down. We get some miscommunication a couple of times between the champions in this matchup. The first time between O'Reilly and Strong leads to a false finish. You think that's the end, but it's not. However, a couple minutes later, another accidental collision between the champs sets up the challengers to take uh, Strong out with a double team burning hammer. I believe that's what it was. And Mustache Mountain wins the match. Holy crap, how could they top you know what they did in the six man? It was hard to do, but it was still a great match. Three and a half stars out of four. Hell of an opener. Great story when you combine what they did the previous night in the six man to night two. The lads winning the titles. Uh, you know, it was spoiled a bit for me. I did know about this uh, when it happened, uh, as it happened, but you know, didn't take me did it did not take away from me the enjoyment I got from this matchup, nor the reaction I had when Mustache Mountain ultimately won. Really enjoyed this matchup. Some women's action up ahead as Killer Kelly, who we saw in that triple threat match the previous night, takes on Charlie Morgan, or who I shall call English Bailey. My one knock on Kelly so far, my limited exposure of her, is that uh, I think her power walk intro, I think, is a little weird. Either she needs to slow down, or the camera crew needs to do a better job of following her and keeping her in frame and having some room for her to walk into, some, some nose room, as they say, because I think it's just, it's way too fast. And in an industry that's all about what's going on here, the moneymaker is Ms would say. I think we're missing a lot of that because she had just like this kind of head down power walk thing. I don't know if that works for her. I would like to see you know, her tickets just slow down a little bit or get the camera crew to compensate. A uh, good showing for both women here. Uh, Kelly showing off her striking ability. Morgan shows off her quickness and occasionally taking it to the air. Uh, the match ends when Morgan wins after countering a vertical suplex attempt by Kelly. I'm going to give it two stars out of four. Very solid matchup here. I think it did a better job. I think it did a better job for Kelly showing off what she can do than that triple threat match. The night before. Also did a great job establishing Charlie Morgan. These two matches here, the triple threat match from night one and this match from night two, does a great job in laying the groundwork for the UK brand's women's division. This match was originally booked as a triple threat match between Mark Andrews, Flash Morgan Webster, and Travis Banks for the number one contendership for the UK title. But just before the match begins, Johnny Sank comes out and says, there will now be a four-man fatal, is what he said. You know, it, it works, though. He introduces the fourth man of this fatal match. It's Noam Dar, who we have not seen in several months since he was out of action with an injury. Wow. Noam Dar and Alicia Fox are back on TV in the same week. Does this mean something? I want to see the return of that duo again. Lots of flippy shit in this matchup. This is basically a 205 live ex exhibition here. Andrews gets worked over. I think he gets the brunt of the action here in this matchup. At one point, he's caught in like two submissions at once. He's getting brutalized here. Dar hits Banks with a giant kick out of the corner to win the matchup, and he is now the new number one contender. A great return turn for Dar. I'm going to give it three stars out of four. Very high uh, high stakes, high risk, fast paced action here. Great stuff here. After the match, the Coffee Brothers, Joe, who we saw in the tournament the night before, and his brother Mark, who was in the audience on night one, take turns beating down everyone in the ring except for Noam Dar. He's on the ramp and he's teasing. He might go in there, but he has second thoughts and walks away. Right off the top of my head, I think, is this going to be a new alliance between the three of them, like the, the Coffee Brothers as Noam's heavies, as he's kind of the ringleader? It sounds almost a little too too close to Undisputed Era, but I mean, that's kind of what I'm thinking at the moment. I mean, I could be totally wrong. The North American title on the line as Adam Cole Bay Bay defends against Wolfgang. Now, Wolfie had a match with Pete Dunne some months ago for the UK title, but that match ended when the Undisputed Era beat him up. A grudge match this is. Wolfgang has Cole on the ropes for much of this matchup. He even catches a second rope attack with a gut buster. I'm guessing, based on how this match is built, that Wolfgang is the heel? Like, I've been saying earlier in the past couple of reviews about the whole Bizarro thing about the Undisputed Era getting cheered over who they're working, but I mean, they're very... They're not not only are the fans reacting that way, the match is booked that way, where Wolfgang is the heel. Maybe the British fans know something I don't, but I always assumed that Wolfgang was a babyface, so I didn't really know what was going on. Maybe it's an England-Scotland thing, but then again, Noam Dar got cheered, so who knows. Wolfie goes for a flying move late in the match, but Cole puts the knees up, hits the last shot to win and retain. I'm going to give this one two and a half stars. After the match, Cole gets to do two of the Adam Cole babies, and the second one is just a nuclear level uh, pop. That was pretty loud.
No British lads in this match. It's a full-on NXT exhibition as the champ. Aleister Black teams with Ricochet to take on EC3 and the Velveteen Dream. Uh, Black, who is the NXT champion, actually made his TV debut at last year's UK tournament in an exhibition match with Neville. A dream with the mind games, tearing off his uh, own shirt to reveal an Aleister Black shirt, rekindling their big rivalry they had last year. Lots of opening shtick here. The first few minutes of this match has almost no wrestling. It's all shtick and posing and you know, getting in each other's heads and stuff. Uh, but things quickly do pick up. I love how Dream works the crowd here. I have to keep going back to Velveteen Dream because he is one of my favorites of this foursome. At one point, he goes to the top rope, teasing he's going to attack Ricochet from the top to the outside, and he goes, nah, and denies them. Great heel work. I love it. It's simple. He seems to tweak his knee after going for the Purple Rainmaker on falling off the top rope. EC3 looks for a tag near the end, but Dream just hobbles off, kind of ignores him, leaving him high and dry. Uh, EC3 milks this for a long time before he turns around eats a black mass, kind of knowing what his fate was. Uh, so Black and Ricochet win the match. My question is, when, you, when, when a spot like that happens, why does the wrestler always turn around and walk toward the danger? If he knows the guy's behind him ready to hit him with something, why does he just walk away? Anyway, three stars out of four. This was a very fun match. In our semi-main event, they're building this as the first women's championship matchup in Royal Albert Hall history as NXT Women's Champion Shayna Baszler defends against Tony Storm, who won the triple threat match in night one. Baszler is very aggressive here, working the leg and the foot, and Tony is selling in kind. For all the aggressiveness that Shayna Baszler is projecting onto Tony, Storm is just like, screaming and shrieking in agony, looks to be in legit pain and she's able to keep going and fight back, but you can tell, you just see the pain in her face and the way she's selling the leg is tremendous. She hits Storm Zero onto Shayna, but cannot capitalize because of the overwhelming pain. She gets the rope break when she's put in the clutch, and then they go to the outside. Shayna puts her back in the clutch on the outside, gets back in the ring. Tony Storm is counted out, and so I'm going to give this one two and a half stars. I'm going to ding it a bit due to the slight letdown of a finish, but Storm looks very strong and courageous here. My one question is, if they spend so much time telling the story of working the leg, why is it ultimately a chokeout finish on the outside with the clutch? I know that's that Shane is finisher, but if you're going to tease the leg, you know, finish with the leg. That's kind of a nitpick for me in this matchup. Again, selling was great, and they did so much work on that, you would think that that would be related to the finish somehow, but that was not the case. It's time for the main event as Pete Dunne defends the UK title against the man who won the tournament the previous night, Zach Gibson. Uh, Gibson working the arm early, trying to set up for Shankly Gates. He throws uh, Dunne's shoulder into the barricade within the first couple of minutes of this matchup here, and that's his point of attack from there on in. Counters upon counters in this matchup here, a very hard-hitting affair. This is British wrestling, just laid bare for you all to see in its just purest form. There's a great shot of Dunne after he's withstanding this, like, beat down in the corner from Gibson. The referee separated him. This is a very long shot. It's very, it's great restraint by the director who, uh, in the booth for staying on this shot for as long as he did. You see Dunn recovering, kind of gathering himself, getting his bearings. The mouth guard's there. He reaches for it, puts it in his mouth very slowly and gets up and he's ready. I loved that shot there. We get some du dual joint manipulation, dual headbutts, and so there's kind of a double down there. Dunn kicks out of the ticket to ride. gets a rope break on the Shankly Gates. A second rope helter skelter by Gibson. Another kick out. Another Shankly Gates. And a another rope break. A defiant Dunn hits the bitter end on a Gibson to pin and retain the championship. Uh, four stars out of four I'm giving this one. What a match. What a story. You think Travis Banks showed grit in his match in the tournament finals. I think Dunn was able to match or exceed that in his defense against Zach Gibson. You know, like I said, I didn't know who a lot of these people were, especially Zach Gibson. And after what I saw in night one and night two, right away, I know who Zach Gibson is. He looks and is at, treated like a star. He got the stars even in defeat in this title tournament. He was able to look great against Pete Dunne and against everyone else he wrestled in. And after the matchup, British Strong Style holding all the gold, looking to be leading the NXT UK brand into this new age. The UK roster gathers on the stage. Triple H says it's their time. And that's where the show ends. My final grade for this two-night event of the UK Championship Tournament 2018 style is an A grade. It is just about as good a couple of nights of wrestling as you could ask for. This is, if you like this kind of wrestling, and if you don't like all the bullshit you see on Raw with the skits and the cheesy promos and the weird gimmicks, this is for you. This kind of stuff is for you. You will be a fan of NXT UK and all of the British wrestling, for that matter. This is great. I mean, of all the matches, and pretty much everything on this show is these two shows, were good to great. There was not a bad match 
among anything we saw here. But the matches that stick out with me the most were the six-man tag, uh, Gibson and Banks in the finals, NXT tag title match, and Dunn versus Gibson. Possibly in a distant second from those, probably the opening match with Gallagher and Gibson in the opening match in the tournament, just because of how like that was the opener. Wow, what a great opening match. The one nitpick I had really with the show, like I mentioned, was the carbon copy booking of last year's final setup. Like, oh my gosh, the babyface is in peril and he's injured. How will he survive? And though they went with the babyface winning last year, at least they changed things up a bit this year and had the heel uh, prevail. And then my, only, my only other nitpick was just the story they told in the women's title matchup where they worked the leg, but it wasn't involved in the finish. But that is the UK Championship Tournament in a nutshell. I think it does a great job laying the groundwork and planting some seeds for what we're going to see in this new NXT UK brand. Right away, you know who the authority figure is going to be. You know who the champions are. It's the, it's the lads. It's the British Strong Style, the, the trio running the show on NXT UK. You've got some introduction to some women wrestlers. You've got uh, some more things going on with the Coffee Brothers and where No Am Dar fits into that. And now he's the number one contender. So yeah, there's a lot of story already being built for the NXT UK brand. And I'm very excited to see where that goes. Another thing I just thought about when we're talking about the NXT UK brand as it will relate to the NXT American brand, will NXT UK have their own takeover shows or will they merge with NXT America? How is this all going to work? My mind's going crazy thinking about it, but let me know what you guys thought about the UK tournament in the comments section below and leave a letter grade in the gimmick in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com and check out Patreon.com slash Wrestling With Regret for exclusive perks and bonus content. I'm Brian Zane and cheerio!